Listener supported. WNYC Studios. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Microplastics. You know, it seems like just yesterday that environmental scientists were raising the alarm about the tiny beads of plastics in face wash. And now these tiny invisible polymer particles seem to have wormed their way into everything else on Earth. Our water, our shellfish, even our beer. Perhaps it was only a matter of time before we found them in ourselves. That's right, we are full of microplastics. And here to explain more and chat about other selected subjects in science is popular science senior editor Sophie Bushwick. Nice yes. to have you back. Nice to be here. So we're, we're, let's talk about this. Where exactly did researchers find these microplastics? So researchers, um, they had a group of eight subjects um, from countries all over Europe and Asia, and they essentially had these subjects keep a food diary for a week, and then at the end of the week they were... They took a stool sample from themselves and sent it to the researchers, and then the researchers had the fun job of picking through that. They were looking for 10 different types of plastic, and they found these these plastic types. They found nine of them, and they were in all of the samples. <laughs> stool samples. So stool they're samples. going right through our bodies. Yep. We eat them, and then we send them out the other end. Only a matter of time, right, with all the microplastics that are around us. Right. Researchers have found microplastics in tap water, in beer. It's in seafood um, because a lot of these plastic fragments get into the waterways and then the fish eat them and we eat the fish. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, a lot of us drink water from plastic bottles or food out of plastic takeout containers or that's been wrapped in plastic. And mm. there's all sorts of chances for fragments to come off. So the definition of a microplastic is that it's smaller than five millimeters, but it can be much, much smaller than that. You know, some of these fragments are on the nanometer scale. And, and we suspect that there's no harm coming from these. Well, it's very difficult to tell yeah. because it, it's hard to sort of parse out. Um, you can't really feed people, some people, plastic samples and not feed other people plastic samples at this point. It's just yeah. not ethically feasible. But um, it, it's, it's hard to tell. Maybe they're just passing through us harmlessly. It's also possible that they could be accumulating and that um, a lot of these plastics carry chemicals that they might mm -hmm. leach into the human body. So it, it's... I wouldn't tell people. I would say don't don't <laughs> panic because it could be yes, it could be that well, they're harmless, but it's very difficult to you tell. Know, at this th point. Those of us of a certain age always thought that asbestos was harmless, also back in the day. Mm -hmm. So well, let's keep our eyes open. Uh, some good news, though. Maybe eating organic vegetables is linked to less cancer. That's right. Uh, a study in France they looked at seven almost seventy thousand people. They had them. Uh, answer a survey how often they had organic food and whether they had cancer. And then the researchers followed up in five years to check in again on whether they had developed cancer. And they also took a lot of other information, such as how often they, they drink or smoke, um, whether how often they eat fruits and veggies, how much they exercise, and also their income level. And what they found is with a, a couple specific types of cancer, like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and postmenopausal breast cancer, people who eat organic did have less of a risk of developing those cancers. So, so was it actually tied to to the vegetables themselves, or could it have been the kind of lifestyle you live if you eat organic vegetable? It's it's really difficult to say because organic pr produce is more expensive in the United States. Right. It's about forty five percent more expensive than conventional, and um, it's also people who who do eat organic tend to have other healthy lifestyle factors. They eat a lot of fruits and veggies. They exercise more often, and because they're wealthier, being wealthy just comes with a whole bunch mm -hmm. of health benefits. You're more likely to afford health care and to go to the hospital for more frequent screenings. So that means you could, if you do get cancer, they can catch it earlier and treat it. Sounds, uh, to, sounds to me like you would need a better designed study to sort of eliminate those other factors if you're going to do it. They did um, They did take the subject's uh, income level and they tried to sort of factor out some of these other um, confounding factors, but it's just incredibly difficult to peel apart um, all the different things that go into human health. Yeah, well, we've been talking about that for Ever since I've been doing this, yeah. yes, no, maybe, whatever. <laughs> well, that's why nutritional studies are so tricky, because yeah. it's it's possible that there's so many other factors involved than just the one that they're studying. Yeah. All right, let's move on to some, uh, a factor that's made uh, w the weather terrible for some people. Hurricane Willa made landfall on Mexico's Pacific coast last week. And what was really interesting about this, the last-minute shifts in intensity, right? Right. Over the course of just two days, Willa went from a tropical depression to a category Category five hurricane. That's we're talking from forty mile per hour winds to one hundred sixty mile per hour winds. 
And, and do we know how that or why that could happen so suddenly? Conditions were, were just perfect for it. It was going over an area with warm water and, and heat fuels hurricanes. It was also in an area with a lot of moisture and there wasn't a lot of wind shear. Wind shear is just when you've got wind at different at different speeds at different altitudes and that kind of thing can really dissipate a storm. And Willa didn't encounter any of those any of that as it was building to a Category yeah. 5. But after that, it did. It actually went back down to a Category 3 before it made landfall. Very quickly also. Yes, again, that uh, was a really quick change. Uh, uh, it's, it's, so is this sort of a, a new pattern then for hurricanes to be expected? It's hard to say. Uh, I think that it's part of a pattern of more hurricane intensity, definitely. So Will is actually the 10th hurricane this season to reach Category 4 or 5 in the Pacific Northeast. It's the most intense season that area has had ever on record. Wow. So um, it's, it's definitely... I mean, researchers have warned that in a warming planet, the hotter it gets, the more intense we can expect hurricane season to be. And, you know, with all the water that these hurricanes drop now, uh, maybe we need a new classification. People have been talking about, well, you know, the wind speed may not just be adequate enough to describe I, I completely agree. It, it, as a matter of fact, most people who die in hurricanes, they die from freshwater flooding, not from wind damage. And category the category system only really talks about wind damage. So I think it is important to talk about flooding. So Willa has made landfall. It moved from Mexico to Texas. And apparently the moisture is going to be affecting the mid-Atlantic states over this weekend. We could be in for our for, first nor'easter of the season. And it's getting fuel from this hurricane. So it's just affecting, in terms of precipitation, a big change chunk of yeah. the U.S. I'm going to get out of here early today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> talking, about, talking about water, we're learning more about what kind of life Mars could support. Talking about water on, on Mars, we're always talking about water there. It's, it's very exciting that there's yeah. water there. Yeah. So researchers, when they found liquid water on Mars, they knew that water had to be really salty because Mars can get very, very cold. And in order for that mm -hmm. water to not freeze, it must have a high salt concentration. So they didn't really look at whether life might be be might have enough oxygen. But a new study has done just that. They said, well, if we have this very salty water at this range of temperatures and at the, these different pressures, how much oxygen would dissolve in that water? Would it be enough to support um, microbes that could breathe it? And they found it would be. It would have enough oxygen to support not only microbes, but certain types of sponges. Sponges. Sponges on Mars. Wow. Not, not the cellulose guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, so sponges are this model oh. organism. And researchers like to, it's very, it's very simple. It's a right. filter feature. It's probably one of the first animals to have evolved. So it's 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 a great thing for researchers to look at and be like, huh, I wonder mm. if this could survive there. Mm, maybe in those uh, moons of Jupiter we find sponges. That would be in. really That'd amazing. Be and it's amazing. It's always amazing to have you, Sophie. Thank you. Sophie Bushwick, uh, Senior Editor at Popular Science. Now it's time to play Good Thing, Bad Thing. Because every story has a flip side. It's become a common sight on social media. You're scrolling along and you see a post asking for donations to support some kind of medical treatment, often because a person doesn't have insurance or they've exhausted their resources. These crowdfunding campaigns can raise a substantial amount of money, but are there ethical concerns? Joining me now to talk about the good and bad of crowdfunding medical treatment is Dr. Ford Vox. He's medical director of the Disorders of Consciousness Program and chair of the Medical Ethics Committee at the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and co-author of a short research letter on medical crowdfunding published this week in the Journal of the American Medical Association. He joins me by Skype. Welcome to Science Friday. Hey, good afternoon, Ira. Good afternoon to you. These crowdfunding campaigns can uh, help bridge the gap financially for people facing expensive medical treatment, but what, what's the downside to this? That's right. So the downside is what are people going to be raising money for? You know, we certainly hope that it's true insurance gaps, of which there are, there are a lot. There's a lot that insurance doesn't cover that maybe it should. Uh, extra added costs when people are off work and important equipment and so forth. But what's potentially dangerous is what you're raising that money for. It might be something that's not evidence-based that could be dangerous. I mean, some sketchy kind of treatment, something like that? That's right. And that's what we focus in on this paper. We looked at five diverse different so-called sketchy treatments, uh, some of the most dangerous ones being stem cells implanted into the central nervous system. People raising money to get this done down in, in Mexico, fly to China, some procedures here in the United States as well, and a variety of other things also that uh, are not FDA approved, potentially highly dangerous. And people in their generosity are donating to these campaigns because 
folks are desperate and they want to help out individuals, but but not really realizing that you could be causing them some real harm. You could be. Uh, how much how much money are we talking about here? So crowdfunding in and of itself is uh, just $8 billion has been raised so far on GoFundMe alone. And medical crowdfunding is the single largest segment of that. As far as the problematic campaigns, I can't say for sure because we just selected kind of a representative sample of five and took a snapshot of the activity. We found folks trying to raise about $27 million for five of these shady treatments, uh, and they raised us over $6 million. You know, some people would say, Hey, what's the, what's the problem here? These patients have a right to try and seek their own cures, try new treatments if others have not worked for them. You're right, and that's kind of the libertarian point of view, and, and it does exist. However, uh, this is a little bit different transaction than uh, you you know, kind of pulling that out of your own bank account or just your own close family or friends. Now a third party is involved, and you potentially causing harm to yourself and that go that that is largely gofundme but the other platforms as well and so they do now have an ethical duty in that transaction is there any way to know if you see one to have, how to find out on your own whether this thing is worth crowdfunding for you there's not and there should be and that's part of the critique uh, that we outline uh, we think that it's the duty of the sites to perhaps filter out some of these campaigns refer them on up to humans uh, to interpret a bit uh, they could have for example kind of a, a medical panel to look at it they could refer people with certain keywords to the appropriate information on the NIH website or other reputable websites for example but uh, uh, you really just have to be an educated mm -hmm. consumer, and that's part of what's the danger of these campaigns is they represent people uh, going around uh, kind of standard hospitals and clinics and physicians who are trying to help people and prevent them from harm and access the treatments that they need, balancing the evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we run out of time. Well, thank you for making us an educated consumer, Dr. F Dr. Vox, Dr. Ford Vox, chair of the Medical Ethics Committee at the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia. After the break, we're going to talk about blood on Halloween. You know, well, I didn't do that too well, did I? Not no. What is? What does it have to be so spooky all the time? Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. I'm Ira Flato. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Halloween is right around the corner, and when you think of the spooky holiday, what comes to mind, right? Ghost, goblins, and of course, blood. Even though blood runs through all of our veins, it somehow has gained a mysterious, sometimes magical reputation. Writers have been fascinated by the substance. It, revised, it revived Odysseus' mother, and it gives vampires their immortality. And doctors have been trying to harness blood by banking it, having leeches suck it from our veins, even searching for synthetic substitutes. My next guest is here to tell us all about that. Rose George is a journalist based out of Leeds, England. Her new book is Nine Pints, A Journey Through the Money, Medicine, and Mysteries of Blood. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you. I guess, um, I guess being from the uh, UK, a pint is the right measurement you would be using for blood. I believe that's something we share with you, though. So I th it's the one thing we have in common, along with miles. <laughs> the, there, uh, there are all these different connotations about blood. The Romans drank it. Homer used it in the Odyssey to allow the dead to speak. Why are there so many almost mystical ideas about blood? I think because for such a long time it wasn't really understood, and the only thing that was understood was that when you saw it, it was probably a very bad thing because it was usually followed by injury and death. So obviously it was a really powerful substance, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't really understood very well until like the last 100, 150 years. So it was given this power because if, if it could kill you so easily when you lost it, then obviously if you drank it or if you were home as mother, you drank a bit of sheep's blood because the sheep happened to be handy in hell. Um, then it could probably revive you. So I think that's how we got to the idea of blood as this life-giving substance. Of course, medically, it is a life-giving substance. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask our listeners to join in. 844-724-8255 is our number. You can also tweet us uh, at SciFry. I, you know, right from the beginning of the book, I, I, I had a, an affinity for it because you mentioned Hemo the Magnificent, which I remember 
seen. No way. You're the first it, person who's ever heard of it. I remember that uh, in, the, in the 50s. And yeah. I, I remember seeing it. I remember a part where they were squeezing. I think they were spurting blood out of a pipe like it would be in an artery. And it yeah. has stuck with me ever since. And I'm so happy that you, you mentioned that because it really put it on the radar screen for me. Yeah, I mean, I just can't, I can't even remember how I came across it, but I was a much, much happier person once I had. Um, it's, it's, it's slightly um, eccentric, should we call it, as a yes. film, but it's, it's just wonderful. And... It's got it's got the it's got poetry. It's got medicine. It's got science. It's got everything, and it's got yeah. I, I it's very hard to describe though. I mean, once you've seen um, vascular sphincters being compared to railroad switchmen, it, it, yeah, it's quite an indescribable film, but yeah, really worth looking up. It's like the early days of television. Quite indescribable and pretty good in some of the things that it did. All right, let's talk about. Uh the taboos about blood. You visited India where there's a, a man trying to break this taboo. Tell us about that. So this is a guy called, whose short name is Maruga. He's got a long Tamil name. He's from South India. And um, a lot of Indians will know him better as Padman because there's been a Bollywood film about him. But his story is extraordinary. He was a uh, very poorly educated um, young man. And his wife came home one day hiding something behind her back and he uh, he thought she was teasing and they had a bit of a you know, tussle and she eventually um, showed him that she was carrying her bloody menstrual rags so a lot of Indian women use cloth they don't have they don't can't afford sanitary pads commercial sanitary pads so Shanti like millions of other Indian women and across the developing world was using cloth there's nothing wrong with that if you can clean it and um, wash it hygienically but because of taboos, uh, that often doesn't happen. Anyway, Maruga um, asked Shanti why she couldn't afford um, commercial sanitary pads because he'd seen them in the market. And she said, well, it's either a sanitary pad or milk, and we need milk. Wow. And from that, um, Maruga, because he's a bit of an extraordinary fellow, um, spent 12 years coming up with a low-cost sanitary pad machine that can be manually operated, so it can be operated by illiterate women, and there are now 4,000 of them all over, um, all over the world. But the way he got to understanding, he had to do uh, reverse engineering to understand what was in commercial sanitary pads, because he thought it was just cotton. Yeah. So he decided that the best way to do that, obviously, was to rig up his own uterus in the form of um, a, uh, a goat's bladder filled with uh, goat's blood. And um, sorry, he had a, sorry. It was a football that he filled with goat's blood, blood, and he attached it to his clothing and had a little pump, and went around all day and every so often pumped it, and so tried to simulate the experience of a menstruating woman. Um, and he learned a lot, <laughs> as I think a lot of men would if they did that. <laughs> um, and also because he lived in South India where it's hot, he uh, he was wearing white. So, which is pretty much every woman's nightmare, no matter what sanitary pad advertising has told us over the years. Um, so, you know, there were stains and leaks, and he spent a lot of time checking behind himself, like women do a lot. And um, he eventually came, understood what was in sanitary pads and has revolutionized sanitary pads in India. Quite an amazing fellow. It is amazing. That's a, that, you know, more men should try that uh, <laughs> to figure out the trials and tribulations of of what women yeah, go through. Yeah, with football. <laughs> I, I think there's so many great little um, moments in your book, I mean, little statistics that just jump out. Let me go through a few of them. You have a stat that every three seconds someone receives a blood transfusion. Wow. Yeah. The, the, oh, yeah. the, you know, the joke behind that is they ought to find that guy and stop him. From, <laughs> but it's actually In the States, it's actually every two seconds. Is that right? Um, yeah, and uh, I was given the breakdown of those figures, and it, it all it all makes sense. Uh, how, how how did this idea of banking blood first come about? Well, when I mean we haven't been this the system that we're all used to, which is the sort of mass donation and um, supply and transfusion of blood. It's really not very old at all. It's about 120 years old, and in the beginning. Um, in the U.S. and the U.K., they they set up they started in pretty similar fashion that people were selling their blood. Um, they had this product that they could sell, and 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 so they did. 
And there was even a union of blood sellers in New York. And there were people who, men usually, who traveled around the country um, selling their blood. So they were their own kind of blood market. Mm-hmm. Um, but eventually, in the 1930s, a, a doctor in Chicago called Bernard Fantus um, tried to organize things a bit better. And he was convinced that the best thing to do um, was to treat blood as a commodity, really. So he thought that what went in must come out, and if you used blood, you should supply blood. So he set up a blood bank. Um, and eventually that transformed um, sort of in the 1970s in, in the US um, the notion of paying for blood um, died out and it's now uh, all donated. It's not actually illegal to sell your blood in the US, but it's just not, it's just frowned upon and not done. Well, you know, I, when I was in college, I knew lots of uh, college students who were selling their blood for, for money, just, you know, for to have some spending cash. Well, you can still do that, but yeah. you, you're, what you're doing is selling blood plasma. Um, so you're selling the yellow stuff, the mm. 55% of liquid in your blood. And, um, yeah, you can do that. The U.S. has got very, very generous regulations about how often you can do that. You can do it twice a week if you want to. Yeah. Other countries only let plasma donors do it every couple of weeks. But, um, yeah, you can earn $30, $50 a pop selling your plasma in the U.S. So, yeah, it's a good income stream for a lot of people. Now, now you write that, that the U.S. is seen as the OPEC of plasma. <laughs> like it, it there's is. a cartel of plasma. Well, there's, it's, that wasn't my phrase. That came from someone in the plasma industry. But it's, it's certainly a global giant in, in the selling of plasma. It supplies 70% of plasma in Europe for, for plasma products. So what happens to plasma? It can either be used for transfusions or it can be uh, refined and fractionated and become med- medicinal products. So um, what the U.S. does is it exports a lot of uh, plasma, which is turned into plasma products around the world, because it takes yeah. so much plasma to get a single product, and other countries just don't have enough of it, right? Because we're not paying people to um, donate it twice a week, probably. Now we know that that uh, blood comes in many different types, but I never realized how many types of blood. A couple of dozen types. I think the International Society for Blood Transfusion, I think, currently lists thirty-seven wow. blood types. Um, so we all know about the main right. four, which is A, B, O, and A, B. And then, of course, we all know positive and negative. So that's another four. Um, so most people think there are probably eight, but if there are lots more uh, rarer and rarer blood types. I mean, there are probably far more than 37, but those are the ones that have been established. Um, and they have pretty cool names. I like the one that's called OK. And then there's one named after Karl Landsteiner, who was the Austrian biologist who discovered that blood was different and that that's why if you gave blood to Mm. someone and they fared very badly and possibly died, it was probably because you shouldn't Mm. mix mix certain types of blood here reacts. I have a a who's on first joke on my head with the blood type OK going, but... (laughs) Yeah. Well, well, but that brings up a point I was uh, always interested in. When did we first discover that you needed to have the right type of blood for the right person? How did we discover that there were types and that needed to be matched? Well, it was a slow process. So when people first started experimenting with removing blood from one creature and putting it in another creature, it was in the 16th, 17th, 17th century, and it generally tended to be two different types of creatures. So because at that point, again, blood was thought to have this spiritual mysterious quality it was thought that if you transfuse someone with blood you would get the quality the characteristics of the creature so sheep's blood was very popular because they were thought to be mild and nice Mm -hmm. um cows were popular too because they were thought to be gentle um dogs dogs dog blood was experimented with a lot um with various uh, results um some people some some experiments uh died and these trans these were transfused into humans But the first real experimentation with human blood going into another human um, was an obstetrician called James Blundell in the 19th century, and he had about a 50% success rate. And there were other people who tried throughout the 19th century, but because it wasn't understood that there were these blood types and that obviously you could have a hemolytic reaction 
um, you could die. So it was not really until Karl Landsteiner in the 1901, um, more or less, discovered blood types. But even he didn't really think his discovery was massively important. He kind of ignored it for about 10 years. Hmm. Talking with uh, Rose George, a journalist uh, based in Leeds, England. Her new book is Nine Pints, A Journey Through the Money, Medicine, and Mysteries of Blood. Uh, Science Friday from WNYC Studios. Um, there have been attempts to create synthetic blood. We've, I've been following it for years, but why is, is it so hard to do that? Because blood is so amazing and because we cannot replicate it, even though so much money and so much effort and so many great minds have been trying, as you say, for decades to try to do it, we still haven't done it and we still cannot reproduce something that does everything that blood, blood does in the body because it's, it's very, very busy. It's, you know, it's transporting oxygen, it's removing carbon dioxide, it's keeping us warm, it's transporting nutrients, um, and we just haven't come up with a synthetic... Um, alternative yet there have been there has been really good progress but and there have been um, synthetic red blood cells which have been used and transfused in fact but the trouble is that at the moment they would be so expensive um, that they're, they're just not a meaningful alternative except in perhaps in rare cases um, so for, for now even despite all the effort um, there is nothing better than the stuff right. that comes out of someone's arm. Tell us about hemoglobin, how that works in the blood cells. I am not, I do not have a medical background, so I don't want to get anything wrong, but I can tell you that when I give blood, um, my hemoglobin takes about three weeks to uh, recover. And um, I am a runner, and I run up hills. So I can tell you what I know about hemoglobin is mm -hmm. it makes running up hills extremely difficult for about three weeks. So it's, it's transporting, um, it's just helping your muscles out, it's your fuel. And uh, if you give a pint of blood, which I encourage anyone who can should do, um, but it w you, will notice, you will notice the difference for a, a couple of days or up to a few weeks. Mm -hmm. So those people who give two pints a week, they must be quite lethargic. <laughs> For, well, they're know. giving plasma. Oh, plasma different. is different. Ah. So plasma is not cellular. Hmm. And you can, you can replenish, your body replenishes your plasma with, within see. 24 to 48 hours. That's right. So you, you're not going to notice that for very long. But your red blood cells take, take longer to recover. You visited a leaching center. In modern day, leaching is a big industry. They're, st they're still doing it very, very, I mean, it's, it's thriving according to your book. It is. And I'm so pleased you asked me about leeches. I'm very fond of them. Um although I don't really like picking them up. Um, so leaching came back into you. So it was, it was widely done throughout the 19th century to the point where the native medicinal leech in Europe was pushed to extinction. And um, they were widely abused, really. Um, and there was a French doctor who was one of Napoleon's doctors who was known as the leecher. And he, he used it almost as preventive medicine, so he would prescribe 60 leeches even before he'd seen his patient. Wow. Um, but then they fell out of fashion once we understood things like germ theory and disease. And because they, they were used for bloodletting and bloodletting was thought to balance the humours in the body once the humoral theory went out the window, um, so did leeches. But then in the, um, about 50 years ago, some Slovenian doctors used them again and found that they were still the best thing available if you have blood that's congested because leeches have a really astonishing anticoagulant in their saliva. So when they, they, when they bite, they, um, they give you this uh, anticoagulant and it can keep blood flowing for up to 10 hours. So if you, for example, you've had something amputated or torn off and it's somewhere where there are lots of tiny blood vessels, they're extremely difficult to stitch together again, to knit together really, and to get the blood flowing. So if it doesn't, what you need is a leech. Right. And um, so they're still widely used by plastic surgeons and microsurgeons. Wow. 
Thank you, Rose George. Fascinating. It's it's a great book. Uh, Rose George is a journalist in Leeds. Her new book is Nine Pints, A Journey Through the Money, Medicine, and Mysteries of Blood. And you can uh, read an excerpt from that book on our website at sciencefriday.com slash plasma. You will really will enjoy it. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, of all our five senses, why olfaction has VIP access to parts of our brain associated with memory. It's got a special pathway right into the brain. We'll talk about it after the break. Stay with us. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Shortcut deep into your brain. Hmm. Notice anything different other than maybe how the room smells? <sighs> Recent studies suggest that breathing through your nose can be linked to improved memory. And that's a note to all of you mouth breathers out there. Here to untangle how olfaction is linked to deeper parts of the brain, controlling emotion and memory, is Christina Zolano, assistant professor at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Zolano, welcome to Science Friday. Hi, thank you. I'm happy to be here. We're happy to have you. So what is so special about breathing through your nose? Well, uh, nose breathing is special because it's how we smell. And smell is a fascinating and really unique sensory system. So evolutionarily, smell is our oldest sense. It's also arguably the least understood of our sensory systems. And there are several key aspects of smell that make it particularly interesting and that make nose breathing really different from mouth breathing. So for one thing, the smell neurons, which live up way up at the very top of our nasal cavities, they actually touch the air as it flows in and out of our noses just during natural breathing. And this is really unusual because these olfactory neurons are the only part of our central nervous system that makes direct contact with our external world. And the way that this information gets from these neurons inside of our noses into the brain is different from all other sensory systems. So all other sensory systems, information relays through a structure called the thalamus before it reaches the cortex and higher order brain areas. But in the olfactory system, information flows straight from the nose into the cortex and higher order brain areas as well, without going through the thalamus. Um, and what's special is that these olfactory structures are located in a part of the brain called the limbic system, which is involved in emotion and fear, learning and memory. So this gives olfaction a sort of privileged access to emotion and memory areas in the brain. And, and because uh, nose breathing is smelling, nasal inhalation provides a sort of entry point by which breathing rhythms can modulate brain activity in these structures. Hmm. Uh, so just the act of breathing in through your nose, does your nose also sense that air is coming in and alert these, this pathway and the end point in your brain to say, hey, something interesting is about to happen? Right. It, yes, actually, it does. So the, the receptors inside of the nasal cavity are not only responsive to chemicals, so they're not only monitoring uh, the chemicals in our environment, but they also are mechanoreceptors, so they can detect the air flowing in and out of the, the nose, yes. Mm. Um, and we found that these natural respiratory rhythms, just breathing, even in the absence of any smell, uh, drives activity in olfactory areas. But interestingly, these, these respiratory-driven brain waves, they don't stop there. So we found that they also propagate to nearby limbic structures, the, the ones involved in emotion and memory. So what this means is that as we breathe, activity across the limbic system is rhythmically increasing and decreasing with inhales and exhales. Um, and this pattern, what we found is that it's only present when you're breathing through your nose. So if you breathe through your mouth, that rhythmic limbic activity goes away. Hmm. You know, a lot of us believe, maybe erroneously, that, that uh, you can suddenly smell something that you remember from 30 years ago. Is right. That, is, that, is that a, a real thing? or a, 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 Well, for me, it's real, but <laughs> why, is that something special to that 
sensory organ? Uh, yeah, you know, the evidence is not clear. The, the study is sort of conflicting on that. Um, the, a couple of studies have found that perhaps olfactory memory, memories tend to be earlier, mm. um, not necessarily stronger. Um, but I would say there's no clear consensus on, on whether or not that's true. Hmm. What, what what about breathing through your mouth? Does that do anything for you? I mean, uh, we we as as far as as tasting food, we've always been told that you smell the food through your nose and it helps your taste buds of, taste what it, what you're actually doing. Is there a connection there? Right, that is true. That's a good point, point. Um, and that's that's what's called retronasal olfaction. So when when we have food inside of our mouths. Um, the air can get from our oral cavity into our nasal cavity, but it flows in the backwards direction. So it's going outward rather than inward. Um, and it definitely impacts flavors mm. and, and taste, yes. Let's talk about your study. How were you able to study this? I understand that you were able to test this with an fMRI. Oh, actually, um, no, That's an, and that's a very interesting point. Um, we did not use fMRI because... In the human brain, the olfactory structures are actually located very, very deep, almost in the center of the brain, uh, making them very hard to reach non-invasively. So we can't record from these areas from electrodes on the surface of the scalp. And functional neuroimaging, uh, we cannot really measure um, brain oscillations with that technique. So to do this study, we worked in collaboration with brain surgeons who implant electrode wires directly into these limbic areas for patients who are undergoing brain surgery for epilepsy. And this provides this a really rare opportunity to record this type of data from human olfactory and limbic structures. Hmm. If, if olfaction and memory are related, do you see people with memory problems also having issues with smell. Uh, right, that, that's a really good point. Um, a lot of neurodegenerative diseases actually do present with early olfactory decline. Um, and while I think our, these findings that we're discussing uh, may not have direct implications for neurodegenerative disease, I think um, the impact of, of breathing on limbic activity certainly suggests potential new avenues and directions of research on, on these diseases. Um, for example, it, you know, it would be interesting to know if these mechanisms may be altered in neurodegenerative disease. Um, and I, I also think that our data point to the possibility that neurodegenerative disease could result in al altered nasal breathing patterns. Um, breathing is so easy to measure, and this is something that we're looking into in, in the lab. So do um, patients with different <coughs> neurological disorders, do they breathe differently? Do they have characteristic nasal breathing patterns? Hmm. So that's something you're, you're going to be following up with. Right, yes. And any neurodegenerative disease in particular? Uh, we're, we're currently collecting breathing data from patients with Alzheimer's disease and patients with Parkinson's disease to see if we can differentiate the two um, states just by analyzing the shapes of their breathing waveforms. Hmm. Are we the only, I'm going to just throw this out because I'm really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Our, I mean, why do we need to breathe through our mouths if we have our noses? And are we the only animals that breathe through our mouths? Well, yeah, you know, I, I really I'm think sorry that's for a, that question, a great but. question. <laughs> and I've spent a lot of time thinking about that, actually. I, I mean, I think the answer probably goes far beyond just the sort of immediate thought, which is that if your nose is congested, you have this alternate breathing route so that you can still get air in and still live, right? My guess breathing number is one. That was vital my guess function. number one. Yes. Um, but we're finding that it really drastically changes our brain activity. So I think that the full answer to that question really remains to be seen, and I think it's a really interesting point. I know that, um, well, most mammals that, that I can think of do pant, and panting is, is typically something that involves mouth breathing. So dogs pant not only when they're hot, but I think also when they're stressed. Uh, cats as well. And I think that's... Um, so there's something interesting about that. 
because mouth breathing is altering activity in these emotion centers and fear centers of the brain. So there may be really something behind that. Wow, I actually asked an intelligent question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's, well, well, you'll come back when you have the answer to that, okay? Because this is really an sure. interesting question. <laughs> Christine Zolano, assistant professor at uh, Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. Thank you. Next up, the midterm elections are less than two weeks away, and on November 6th, millions of Americans will be casting their votes in districts that have been declared unconstitutional by a federal court. Districts that courts say have been unfairly gerrymandered to favor one political party over another. And some of these gerrymandered districts are at the center of a court case that's sitting in the queue at the Supreme Court and some of the key evidence against the districts. What is that key evidence? It's math. How do you like that? That's the topic of the next episode of our Undiscovered podcast. And our co-hosts, Annie Minoff and Ella Fetter, are here to talk about it. Welcome back. Thanks so much Thanks. for having us. Give me a quick refresher on uh, gerrymandering. Okay, I'll give you a really quick refresher. Uh, the short answer is gerrymandering is when politicians basically mess with district maps, change the shapes of those districts to help their own party win more seats. So you've probably seen, you know, the the snaky districts, the the famous salamander district. Mm -hmm. um, How gerrymandering got its name. Yep. The one that Annie likes to call the leaping Pomeranian. Yes. <laughs> um, Where was that? <laughs> that's in North Carolina. I think I'm the only one. <laughs> You're the only one who that. sees it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but, but it's not illegal, right? Well, that's kind of the big question. I mean, the courts have been very clear that some kinds of gerrymandering are unconstitutional. So mm -hmm. if you're gerrymandering in a way that's going to disadvantage um, people of a particular race, that's unconstitutional, and we would hope that a court would strike down that map pretty quickly. But where it gets complicated is with political gerrymandering, which is where you're drawing the map to discriminate against Republicans or Democrats. And there, the courts have been really reticent to get involved. So the Supreme Court kind of hasn't given a clear answer to politicians about whether this is OK or not. And in the absence of that clarity, politicians are kind of having a field day. So I wanted to uh, play you a clip, Ira, that really took my breath away the first time that I heard it. And this is a state legislator from North Carolina, David Lewis. He's a, a Republican state rep, talking about how Republican legislators in North Carolina were going to redraw the state's congressional map. I propose that we draw the maps to give a partisan advantage to 10 Republicans and three Democrats, because I do not believe it's possible to draw a map with 11 Republicans and two Democrats. So he actually said this on camera. It wasn't entirely subtle. <laughs> he would uh, take them all if he could. Yes, yes. If I could gerrymander any better, I would have. Uh, this is Science Friday from WNYC Studios talking uh, about uh, gerrymandering. Uh, yeah. And well, so those comments by Representative Lewis actually prompted a lawsuit by some North Carolina voters and, and good government groups to try to get this gerrymandered congressional map taken down by the court. So tell me about this case. How, how does the math fit in on this case? Okay, so, so traditionally in partisan gerrymandering cases, one of the things that they've had missing is is this question of how do you prove a gerrymander? How do you actually quantify how much a particular map is hurting Republicans or Democrats? And, and that's where math can really help. Math is pretty good at quantifying things. Uh, so in this North Carolina case, one of the, the experts is a Duke math professor named Jonathan Mattingly. And he came up with a way to actually quantify how skewed a map is. Yeah. And, and so that would, if he's a math professor, he'd made a calculation. It's probably straightforward, right? Uh, at, at straightforward might be pushing it. But the theory behind the calculation is quite straightforward because the case he's making is, if you're going to call a particular map gerrymandered and say this map is skewing election results, then it would help to know what a normal election result would have been for that year. If you're going to say something's mm -hmm. unusual and gerrymandered, you'd better know what usual looks like. And so the way he figures that out is he takes the actual votes that people cast in an election. So like all the votes that North Carolinians cast in the congressional race in 2012. And then he calculates how many seats Democrats and Republicans would have won if the district maps had been just a little bit different. 
And he does this thousands of times with thousands of nonpartisan alternative redistricting schemes and then sees, you know, well, how different is my, you know, quote unquote, average result from what we actually saw. And what he found, for example, in that 2012 congressional race is North Carolina elected four Democrats to Congress in 2012. But Jonathan saw actually a more typical result would have been six or seven Democrats. So now he can look at that map and say, you know what, that map that elected four Democrats, it's unusual. It's atypical. And I'm able to quantify that. So that, that's what he set out to do is really key finding. But it was actually something else that really surprised Jonathan when he did all of this. Um, I'll let him explain it. I saw in my analysis that by never changing a single vote, by only redrawing the districts, I could change the number of Democrats elected from four to nine out of 13. And we would consider each of those, you know, we would call that a wave election, either of those, right? And extremes, but with the same votes, you can create a wave election for the Republicans and a wave election for the Democrats. So that that's kind of amazing. Like mm. Jonathan is looking at an election where the votes are unchanged, one set of votes, but depending on how he you know, moves those district lines around, he can create an election that's a landslide for the Republicans or a landslide for the Democrats. That is how powerful gerrymandering is. So this this mathematician is, is going to court with this stuff. That is correct. So last October, this mathematician, Jonathan Mattingly, was an expert witness in a court case. He actually took the stand on behalf of those North Carolina voters who were suing the state over this map. And his goal was to try to convince the federal judges that, hey, this this map is gerrymandered. And how did that go for him? Well, we're hoping that you'll listen to the episode. This is a, this is a, cliff, a shameless cliffhanger. Or you can check the news. Anyway, but uh, it's a great it's a great story. Sounds um, great. And an important one right now. Yeah. yeah. You can hear it next Tuesday. If you subscribe, uh, you can get it straight to your device when it shows up on Tuesday morning. And just, just go anywhere where you get your podcast, search for Undiscovered, or visit our website, undiscoveredpodcast.org. This is just perfectly timed. Yeah, that's yeah. very nicely. Nice. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. You guys work very hard. Ella uh, Fetter and Annie Minoff are the co hosts and producers of our Undiscovered podcasts. Uh, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, or as they say, check them out at undiscoveredpodcast.org. Or, thank you, guys. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Charles Berquist is our director. Our senior producer is Christopher Taliata. Our producers are Alexa Lim, Christy Taylor, and Katie Heiler. Our technical engineering help today from Rich Kim, Sarah Fishman, and Kevin Wolf. We're active all week on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the social media, and your smart speakers will play Science Friday whenever you ask them. So every day now is Science Friday.